it really is an interesting time right now because more than ever, it feels like Saudi Arabia is in the news. More than ever, it feels like Iran is in the news. And the one question I would like to start this off with is a lot of the time, the conversation in and around the Middle East is seen through the prism of America. Absolutely. It's how America sees the Middle East and it's how Americans see the Middle East. But how does the Middle East see what's happening in the Middle East right now? You know, you have a section at the moment, war in the Middle East, it's personal. Yes. Well, it is very personal, right? If you live in Beirut, if you live in Baghdad, if you live in Cairo, it's very personal what's going on at the moment. It involves uh, uprisings, it involves protests, it involves the killing of Qasem Soleimani, of course, mm -hmm. the head of the Iranian Quds Force, part of the Iranian Revolutionary, Islamic Revolutionary Guards. Um, that strike was uh, ordered by President Trump. And I know that here in the US, the concern was, oh my God, President Trump is taking us to war. This strike is crazy. Right. But if you look at it from the Middle Eastern side, we kind of are already in constant upheaval and constant war. And for a lot of people in the region who are afraid of Iran's regional um, ambitions, and its proxy militias right. that act in countries like Iraq and Lebanon and Syria, uh, the assassination of Qasem Soleimani was a welcome thing and a lot of people uh, celebrated. So there's a debate, a political debate here about whether what Trump does is good or bad for the country and the yes. Democrats are very critical of him. In the Middle East, we look at it, is this good for us or not? It is interesting because in the region, one thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is that no group, no country is homogenous because even within Iran, there were people who were mourning the death of Soleimani, and then there were those who were completely against what Iran was doing in retaliation. I mean, when the, when the, when the plane was shot down with the passengers, yeah. you know, that was, that was a big uprising against the Iranian government. This book, though, is really interesting because it really lays it out in, in if I may be so bold as to say, in a simple way. You know, when you talk about why Saudi Arabia and Iran began this proxy war and this, this cold war between each other, what do you think is, is the inciting incident? 1979, that is the turning point in the Middle East. That is the year when Iran had a revolution and became a theocracy. And I don't mind that you call it simple because this book is really not just for experts. It mm -hmm. is for your audience, it is for people in the United States, it is for anyone who wants to understand more about the Middle East and wants to go beyond the headlines about tyrants and terrorists. Right. This is 40 years of history seven countries and 15 incredible people whose lives are upended by the politics and the geopolitics. People like you and me who've had difficult pasts, difficult childhoods. And when you tell their stories, you can really get to the heart of the geopolitics and you can explain the bigger picture in a much more accessible way. And the key of the book is to try to explain why the Saudi-Iran rivalry is so enduring mm -hmm. and why it is of huge consequence to the world's security and America's security. When you look at the relationship between Saudi Arabia and the US, especially under Trump, there's no denying that in many ways it feels like Saudi really has a hold on Donald Trump. You know, he, he loves to work with them slash and for them. And his phone. Right, they may have his right. phone now. That's what people are wondering about Kushner yes. and the WhatsApps after what happened to Jeff Bezos. When you look at Saudi Arabia, especially under um, bin Salman, you have a ruler who is lauded on one end as being, you know, really... Reformer. Reformer, the person who's changing the way things are in Saudi Arabia. Women can drive and we're trying to become more liberal and we're trying to just, you know, modernize the country. At the same time, though, there's the killing of journalists and now it looks like there's the hacking of people. How is he seen in the region and maybe even in Saudi? Do, do you have any insight into that? You know, I'll say two things. One, he is a reformer when it comes to social and cultural norms in the country. In, yes. Inside Saudi Arabia, women can drive, but some of them are also in jail because they campaign for the driving. He wants the credit for allowing women to drive, not the activists. Interesting. He, you know, his people also... Um, help carry out the murder of a journalist, Jamal Khashoggi, who was a friend and whose story is one of the stories I tell uh, in Black Wave. Um, but he's a reformer only to some extent, even within the country. You know, a lot of the traditional values are still there. I mm -hmm. think the conservative values and the very narrow understanding of his religion and of Islam have been untouched. So you could say that his reforms are very far reaching, but also smoke and mirrors. The second part of it is my theory is that Mohammed bin Salman and Saudi Arabia would actually like to be a little bit more like Iran. Whatever you think of Iran, they have a very successful regional strategy. Uh, they have proxy militias, they have very loyal allies, and they manage this very well, and they've been doing it for 40 years, and they are feared and respected. And that's something that Saudi Arabia has never quite managed, despite 
all the money that it throws at its allies. Right. It doesn't buy the same kind of loyalty. So I think Mohammed bin Salman wants to be a little more like the tough guy in the region, a little bit more like Iran, a little bit more like Qasem Soleimani. And I know that that's going to upset a lot of people in both countries. But I pull no punches. I really, I'm an equal opportunity critic. And I think both countries have done a lot of damage in the Middle East. It's, it, it really is a fascinating look at how the Middle East came to be in many ways. Uh, before we go, if you're looking at Iran right now, you're looking at what happened with Soleimani, you're looking at how Iranians are reacting to it, you know, uh, both the leaders speaking out and, and, and those in, in parliament, for instance. Is there any indication of how Iran is going to move forward from what has happened? I wrote about 40 years of history here. It took me 40 years to figure out what had happened in 1979. So I wow. hope you'll invite me back on your show in 40 years from now. Wow. But what I can tell you um, is that I think there's something coming undone in the region. 40 years after 1979, people are protesting, not only in Iran, but also in Iraq and in my own country of Lebanon. People are protesting corruption. They're protesting uh, mismanagement of their countries, of their economies. They want a different future. They want what everybody wants. They want hope, they want dignity, they want justice. And I think that Iranians want that too. And I think that we are capable in the region of getting there without outside help. I think we can do it. It costs a lot of lives, but I think the younger generation is ready to let go of this very difficult past and forge a different uh, path forward. Well, here's to hoping you're right. Thank you so much for being Thank on the show. Thank you so show. much. Black Wave goes on sale January 28th and is available for pre-order right now. Kim Gattas, everybody.